Okay, welcome back to our discussion of the Gauss-Markov theorem when we're trying to figure out when is ordinary least squares the best and we just got done talking about the first assumption of the classical linear regression model that the regression is linear in the coefficients is correctly specified and has an additive error term. And we discussed what linear in the coefficients means and that correctly specified says we have the right functional form and the correct set of variables and that an additive error term means that you use the y-intercept and the slopes to come up with a predicted value for an individual and for example 29 miles per hour uh, per gallon for a particular car with certain characteristics and then that's not the actual value but that there's some random process that generates a an error term so an error term is the theoretical notion and a residual is an actual value for one particular observation but that random value is simply added or subtracted to the average or expected value and that you could in in many situations have a multiplicative or divisive or, or some other sort of error term where you consult a random number generation process and rather than adding it to the prediction it multiplies uh, to that but we're assuming it's got to be additive now let's look at the next assumption of the classical model here that has to be true in order for ordinary least squares to be the best method to use this next assumption says that that residual that error term has to have a zero population mean and I want to point out that this is one of the least discussed or least talked about assumptions of the model and let me try to show you what it means and and what it would mean if it wasn't true and why we don't talk about it very much so for the error term to have a zero population mean this is the theoretical error term now as we know when you use OLS the observed residuals will have a zero mean and so suppose though that theoretically the line that should be estimated has uh, looks like this this red line and suppose that relationship that should be uh, observed or the real line sometimes I call God's line the real relationship is a y-intercept of 5 plus a slope times some variable plus some kind of error term and suppose that that real error term had an average of 3 that might be what it looks like if this red line was the real relationship but where is the line well it doesn't go through the points it, it's below the points and the average residual here might be 3 so the average is, is 3 away from this red line. Now, to be honest, I've never come up with an, a good example that makes sense where this should be the case. Why, why should the, the correct line under-predict the uh, observed data by 3? So again, I, I'm not sure exactly what, what that kind of situation would look like, but this is what a graph would look like. The line you use to predict is consistently on average three below uh, where the data is on average so what is going to happen if you use ordinary least squares to estimate uh, this relationship well rather than c actually coming up with the the red line you're going to come up with the blue line so you're not going to get a y-intercept of five and a slope of whatever the slope is you're going to get a y-intercept of eight and then the slope you'll get the correct slope but you'll get the incorrect y-intercept and the residuals that you see will have an average of zero rather than having an average of three so this assumption is just saying if there was some kind of situation where the average residual average stochastic error term should be three you're not going to be able to find it with ordinary least squares what's going to happen instead is your y-intercept instead of being 5 would be 8. So that average of the residual average stochastic error term uh, 
will, if it's not zero, is going to be absorbed into the y-intercept. So we don't talk about this much. You, you will almost never read a study that uses regression where they will say, well, you know, we're, we're worried that the average of the stochastic error term is not going to be zero. So you don't really talk about it much, but this does give a reason why we we don't discuss in most studies we don't discuss the y-intercept seriously because just in case the average stochastic error term was not zero that's going to bias this y-intercept we'll get eight instead of the true five if that were the case so it's just one more reason not to seriously interpret the y-intercept as really meaning something it's just a placeholder and in this case, what it's going to do is absorb any, any situation where the error term really wasn't zero. So I'm going to just leave that there, now that you can kind of picture what's going on. Um, the third assumption is quite important. But in an introductory course, you don't spend a lot of time talking about it, because it can be very difficult to control or deal with if you do have a problem. But let me just give you uh, an example of what's going on here. Assumption 3 says that all explanatory variables are uncorrelated with the error term. Now, you'll often hear economists call this assumption simultaneity. So simultaneity. Simultaneity is a situation where if the error term is large, it can change the value of one of your explanatory variables. So that's what correlated with the error term would mean. So if an explanatory variable is related to the error term, you have a problem that, some, that is sometimes called simultaneity. It means that the error term and a variable, or more than one variable, are determined simultaneously at the same time. An example uh, might help you see what's going on here. Suppose our model is that the crime rate in a city is equal to some y-intercept plus a slope times income plus another slope times uh, how many police officers you have uh, per thousand people or per square mile plus some error term. Now that might be the correct model. Now, if you're really interested in figuring out what is the relationship between adding a police officer and the crime rate? Well, what you would hope is that adding a police officer would lower the crime rate through prevention efforts or being on the ground in community relations and uh, getting people to feel comfortable with reporting crimes, etc. However, let's look at a particular city. Suppose there's a particular city whose uh, realization of the stochastic error term is positive. And suppose, I don't know what the units are here, but suppose this is a very large positive number uh, that for some unknown reason this just happens to be a city that has a huge crime problem. Now, so the observed crime rate is going to be unexpectedly large by 50. What is also likely to be true about this city? It is also going to be very likely to have a large police force. Why? Well, because they have such a huge crime rate these people hire extra police officers in order to try to help keep them safe from these roving bands of thugs. So this is an example where the fact that an error term is large it jointly determines or simultaneously helps determine the fact that this explanatory variable is going to be large. So what's going to happen is although you would expect on average that if you add police you see the crime rate go down in your data you're not going to be observing people adding police and causing the crime rate to go down instead what you're going to see sometimes are 
cities that have high crime rates for a random reason have large police forces and so that's going to make you think that large police forces are associated with high crime rates and it might even make you think erroneously that adding police officers causes crime and even though some cynics might believe that that's probably not the relationship that you're you're trying to estimate in your equation so this is an important uh, assumption of the model that you're only going to be able to get an accurate estimate of this relationship if I add police how much will crime go down if your explanatory variables are unrelated to your error term.